you don't even have to eat donuts to have insulin resistance, which is super scary. And so when we start to see that kind of creation, we know that insulin plays a big role in estrogen dominance. We know that insulin plays a big role in polycystic ovarian syndrome. You know, we wonder why younger girls are getting polycystic ovarian syndrome. Polycystic ovarian syndrome, it's an insulin issue. It's not an ovarian issue. Yes, hence it's happening in the ovaries. Um, and we're unfortunately downgrading our reproductive hormones and increasing our androgens. But the root cause is oftentimes stress, nutrient deficiencies, gut issues that can be driven and insulin deregulation that can be driven by stress and just prolonged exhaustion. Welcome to the Betty Rocker Show, the place to be to nourish your mind, love your body and rock your life. Welcome back, rock stars. Thank you so much for joining me today as we welcome the one and only Dr. Marisa Snyder. She is a functional practitioner and women's health expert who focuses on balancing women's hormones, making her an amazing contributor to our ongoing conversation about women's hormone health. She is the author of seven books and counting, including the number one national best-selling book, The Essential Oils Hormone Solution, which you may have heard me mention before. In this conversation, we talk about a broad spectrum of women's health and hormone topics from fertility to menopause, the science of stress and how it impacts our bodies, the way perceptions of gender, race and socioeconomic status have created unfair limitations and access to good care in medicine. And we cover a topic that has been very present in all our hormone health series shows, which is the way women in general have felt dismissed for their concerns about their hormone health. We get a little heated getting into this because it's infuriating when you realize that this great gift of a amazingly beautiful machinery that is the female body has not historically been the study of intense scholarly research, has been seen as too complicated, and that it hasn't been until really recently that science has started actually to try to catch up in its understanding of how we are wired. If you haven't seen Stacey Sims' TED Talk called Women Are Not Small Men, that is a great one to listen to and really captures the shift in understanding that women's medicine and care should be given a lot more attention and that you are deserving of a lot more access, attention, and care when you see a healthcare provider. I am so glad you're here listening. All women deserve great care. Your concerns and feelings are valid. You do not deserve to be dismissed. And this goes for everything from the doctor's office to getting a job to literally everything in your life. Ladies, we are here to shine, not shrink. So without further ado, let's welcome our wonderful guest. All right, Dr. Marisa Snyder, it is such an honor to have you here on my show, finally. Wow, yay, welcome. Yay, I'm so happy to be here, Bree. You know you're one of my favorite people in the whole wide world, and I feel so honored to be here. Oh my gosh, it's mutual, and I have been so excited to bring you on for the Women's Hormone Health Series for so many reasons. You really are someone who sees things in so many different ways and is able to tie a lot of pieces together for us. Plus, you're one of the few doctors I know who really speaks to essential oils in around hormone therapy and just in natural ways to really address imbalances. Marisa, right now, while we're getting to interview her, is actually pregnant, and she's been talking about it on her social media. And I think it's just fascinating to get to talk to someone with this much expertise in hormones and in women's health who's actually going through pregnancy for the first time. At Um, 41. I'm so impressed, girl. What are some of the insights that you've had along the way with your pregnancy? You know, I've had so many insights. One, clearly I waited a little while to get pregnant for the first time. And, you know, my journey has been up and down like so many women. And the last kind of big journey that I had before getting ready for this pregnancy was back in 2018. So the summer of 2018, when Alex, my husband and I decided that we were going to try to get pregnant, I got diagnosed with an autoimmune condition, Hajimoto's thyroiditis. And we decided to put the pregnancy on hold a year. And it felt a little scary. Girl, I wasn't getting any younger and, but I knew that I needed to get my body on track to make sure that not only was my body healthy, but the baby was healthy as well. So I spent a full year getting myself into remission, really prepping my body for this pregnancy in terms of nutrition, 
supplementation. I did a lot of work on trauma. I did work on stress, self-care. I mean, I did the whole thing really just preparing for this moment. And so when we decided to start trying to get pregnant, I ended up getting pregnant pretty quickly. And that's kind of how I treated this entire journey, even throughout my pregnancy, is really what are the ways in which I can set my body up for success, my hormones up for success, but specifically how I manage my stress levels, how I manage my, um, my emotional state, my emotional resilience, and making sure that I've got all the key nutrients to continue to feed and nourish my body. So I would say that the biggest lesson in pregnancy, and I probably may have learned this lesson a little bit over the years, but the biggest lesson for me was just full surrender. Being a woman who runs a company and has a big mission, and you know, I'm always so mission driven, and I, I'm always I, I feel like sometimes the mission drives me. And during this pregnancy, you know, it's kind of brought me to my knees in many ways, and I have just learned that full surrender while making sure that I was optimizing everything that I could in my pregnancy. So that's been my journey so far. Um, I've dug deeper into women's hormone health, especially um, for women trying to get pregnant. And then during pregnancy, I feel like there's a lot of unknown and misconceptions. And then also what postpartum can look like for women as well. So it's been an amazing journey. I've had the opportunity to learn so much more about myself and about women in general. Thanks for sharing that. So one of the things that I know that you're working on is a book about perimenopause and menopause and our hormones around that time. I guess what really I'm curious about are the ways that stress impact impacts our hormone health in general? And what have you learned and what do you teach people about that specifically? Well, I think personally, in all of my research that I've done over the years, and at once upon a time, being a recovering stressaholic for over a decade, you know, I was the poster woman for rushing women's syndrome. I always had somewhere to be. I could get from- <laughs> Rushing <laughs> women's syndrome, I love it. You know, if you were in a line, a bathroom line with me, behind me, it was your lucky day because I could pee <laughs> faster than anybody. If you were at the gas station and you were behind me, I could pump gas in, in 90 seconds. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I was all about efficiency and I constantly timed myself on how fast I could do things. And I could get really frustrated with people because they weren't efficient enough. Like I was the kind of girl, I would never take a grocery cart into the grocery store. It was always a basket and best, but I was bobbing and weaving through people like nobody's business. Hopefully you didn't catch an elbow when I was moving past you. I could be in and out of the store in 10 minutes, done. You know, and so I just, I just, that's how I operated for so long. And in my mid twenties, I remember feeling some symptomology, some migraines here and there, some, a little bit of weight gain, you know, feeling like I needed an extra little something, something, whether it was a kind bar and a cappuccino at three or four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and just starting to feel like my body was in this process of slowing down, but not my brain, not my ability to be efficient. And I remember asking friends of mine, my mom, just like, is, are some of these symptoms normal? And everyone told me, no, this is exactly how women operate. This is exactly how women are. You are operating um, at the full tilt of, of your full womanness is getting, you know, you're, you're getting stuff done. Um, and I, I, as I look around, most of us, as you just mentioned, as we're, we're connecting with the audience, most of us are operating at that capacity. We are rushing from one thing to the next and not recognizing that there are major consequences to those, to that everyday response system. Um, and so when I look at the root causes for hormonal imbalance, I would say that although stress is what I consider an intangible, it's not super easy to measure. Yes, we can measure cortisol, but it's not really easy to measure perceived stress that can happen up to 50 times a day. You could literally be clutching pearls 50 times a day, you know, that always that, that little stage, yeah. like, you know, and, um, and not even know it. I, I'll do it to my, I'm, I'm better and better every day. I, like I said, I'm recovering, I'm recovering stressaholic, but occasionally I'll, I'll, I'll make that noise and go, oh, and Alex, my husband is always like, what's, what's wrong? What happened? And you know, it's, it's, in, I'm just in my little world kind of managing my own perceived stress, but perceived stress and trauma are two massive root causes that drive hormonal imbalance in many different directions. Not only hormonal imbalance, it depletes nutrients, key nutrients like magnesium, B vitamins, vitamin D, and then it also suppresses the immune system, kind of similar to how sugar suppresses the immune system. Chronic stress or even acute stress can suppress the immune system 
you know, from two to four plus hours a day. And if you're constantly in a state of stress because you're getting dinged, you know, on social media, you're getting a text message from a best friend who's having a moment, you've got to go pick up your race and pick up your kids from school. And then, you know, you just look at the laundry list of endless tasks and obligations running off mostly adrenaline and cortisol for most of the day and to get through the day until one, at one point, eventually, um, as I experience, we end up crashing and burning. Um, and and we, we can call that burnout. We can call that chronic fatigue. Um, we can call that anxiety. Um, there's a lot of different names that we, we can put to it. Um, but we know that perceived stress or just stress in general has massive implications on the body, not, not just our hormone system. Mm, like brain health, um, like, like you were talking about with the depletion of the nutrients um, and then mm -hmm. go back yeah, to cognitive we, we function. Yeah, shut off our cortex completely. Our, our, our rational center, our problem solving center. We, why would we need our cortex when we could just survive off of the reptilian brain, the limbic brain? Um, when we do that, we end up, we end up over activating the, the amygdala. And so instead of when a stressor comes to us, and here's the thing is breathe, they're never going to stop. There's always going to be something every single day. Um, you are more hyper triggered to respond in a reactive way, in a stressed way. Um, and so when we, when we use our stress response survival system too much, to get our day-to-day -day tasks done or to handle the obligations of our community and our family and our work, we ultimately end up downgrading some of the most important parts of our brain and upgrading survival of the fittest part of the brain, which really isn't doing us any favors. Oh, man. You mentioned trauma. This is something that creates an underlying stress that we're not necessarily aware of. That's just kind of, it does make us more reactive. It can, if we have not resolved or have not addressed the root cause, you know, because we're dealing with like the day-to-day -day stress, our laundry list of stuff. But then there's like the, what is the root cause of why some of us overtrain so much because we're so hyper-focused on how we look because we actually, if we keep going deeper and deeper, we really need to feel loved and we feel like we can't get loved if we're not worthy. And if we're not looking attractive enough, we're not worthy. And right, like there's all this like root cause stuff that goes back to yeah. a certain kind of trauma that actually activates this undercurrent that runs our life. Absolutely. And that's why trauma is on that list as well. You know, at one point in time, you know, every single one of us has experienced either big T's, maybe it was child abuse, maybe it was sexual abuse, maybe someone, you know, violently hurt us. You know, there's a lot of different forms of the big T's, especially in our formidable ages where our brain really captures that and tells us never again, right? And, and, and constantly sends us warning signals that that can't happen to us again. That's a dangerous place, you know, um, or it could be, it could be small teas, you know, a teacher telling us we weren't worthy enough, a, a parent saying, you know, you're never going to be as smart as your sister, um, you know, it could, or some stranger making some nasty comment about you on the street that, that they, no one, none of them ever, ever had authority to do so, but it's still, it, 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 it ties deep into that belief system. It's stored deep in the hippocampus and the amygdala. Again, that limbic system, that's survival. And it, it can, those, those traumas can be easily triggered um, because they become beliefs for us. They become, you know, one of my biggest beliefs that was driving my um, stress addiction. Again, again, I didn't know I was addicted to stress. I thought it was my slight edge. I thought it was my secret, my secret, like power behind I, the I used to think could... the same thing. Yep. <laughs> right. Yep. You're like, oh, wait, let me, let me activate this sexy yep. little hormone over here and, and kick everyone's butt. Yeah. But, um, um, I remember I used to, I used to go to Orange Theory I remember in, in one of my major burnout moments. And I used to, it was my mid thirties and I would race these 20 year olds at Orange Theory. <laughs> I would kick everyone's butt, but man, I was, that was the end of my day. I was flatlined for the rest and, of and the day. And it's also like, where did that come from too in your brain that felt right. like you needed to be, beat needed people? To compete. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I was the only one running the race. No one else was participating. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. um, but for me, when I had, when I experienced my massive chronic fatigue and I started doing what I considered Brie, some of the best things, I started doing yoga. I started drinking green smoothies every day. And I always say, you can't green smoothie your way out of chronic stress. No, You know, it, and not the smoothies can't help, 
but if you keep doing the same activities, you're going to get the same result. Right. Um, and I wasn't changing my mode of operation. Um, but what I finally figured out after two years of continuing to fall back on the floor after I looked like from the outside, I was making some big healthy changes. And ultimately, there was this underpinning, that belief. And my biggest belief was that my worth was directly proportionate to my productivity. And if I wasn't productive, if I ever looked what quote unquote lazy, if I ever seemed like I wasn't working six to seven days a week, if, then to me, I, I, wasn't wor- I wasn't worthy of love. I wasn't worthy of connection, friendships, success. And recovering from that has been my greatest gift and greatest lesson. Um, it's, 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 I'm not going to pretend like it's easy to un, unpeel the layers of that, that worthy onion, you know, and get down to the nitty gritty of it. And for some of us, um, breaks my heart, many of us just don't even know that that's what we're being driven by. That's what I was getting at with the- seated beliefs. Exactly. Yeah. And because for me, it was all about, appearance, right? Like I wasn't worthy unless I looked a certain way. You weren't worthy unless you were productive. We were both being driven by this root of worthiness and our own intrinsic value. So we all have things that create challenges for us in life. And that's why, you know, you want to be able to go to a doctor who can help you. But something that really bothers me is that not only do women in general often find themselves getting dismissed around hormone issues and not taken seriously, but that women of color and black women have historically been treated even more unfairly by by the system and not only have to deal with the challenges and intrinsic stressors they may face from generational trauma and a system that has made it even more challenging for them to get access to resources at all, but that they're also facing racism and prejudice when they do go to get care. Absolutely. I mean, when we're looking at generational trauma, we're, we're looking at socioeconomic trauma, we're looking at racial disparity trauma, and that generational trauma that's carried down through epigenetics. Mm. Yeah, we're, it's, it's, a, it's much higher stakes. It's no surprise at all that we see people of color, especially Black people, Latinos, really struggling with things like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and other chronic conditions, even especially hormone issues. Your hormones are the white flag. They're going to be the first ones who throw up the white flag to tell you that something isn't right because they're constant communicators. That's, that's really all your hormones are designed to do is send messages to the body based on what's going on in the environment. That's what your hormones are trying to do. Okay, well, Bree's going this way. Okay, we need to let the body know what's going on. Bree's right. going that way. We need to, you know, oh, she's eating this or she's having a moment. I need to go and tell insulin, we need more of that. I need to tell the immune system to shut it down. I need to tell the reproductive system, hey, right now we're in emergency mode. We ain't got time to procreate. Wow. You know, so your body's constantly having to send messengers all over the place. Thyroid hormone gets dumped so that it can help drive cellular metabolism. Your hormones are literally just the chemical messengers that are the communication system that is just gearing your body up for whatever you're having to deal with in the external world. That's the reason why they're the first ones to go up. It's it's your first warning sign. It's kind of like when the check engine light or the oil light goes on in the car. That's your hormones giving you a major indicator that they're picking up on something that isn't working properly. Yes. So yes. So trauma in in terms of socioeconomic and because of racial disparities is massive. And what's interesting, you know, even within the medical community, and this is this is the most heartbreaking, is in the medical community we have a lot of preconceived notions about how we should treat women of color, black people, um, Mexican people, you know, there were many years where people thought that black women um, in childbirth just didn't feel pain like white women did, you know, and it was, it's just crazy. We, we don't listen to them as well. For some reason, we got this weird memo, um, this inappropriate memo that, um, that we shouldn't pay as much attention or care or concern when it comes to women, black women in pregnancy or infertility or with when it comes to reproductive issues. And so we, we have a lot of unlearning to do, even just in the medical system. And then, yes, access to proper medical care, access to great food, access to great resources. Those things are still lacking across the board um, that we see in, um, in, in major cities with, with higher proportion ethnicity of, of black and brown people. Thank you for addressing that because I feel like it's something that 
I don't think I don't think everybody's really aware of that. I know that black people and people of color are very aware of it, but not everyone and everyone can be an ally and can raise their voices and we can demand that this change. And doctors such as yourself who are outspoken and aware, you know, are making a difference. So I'm really grateful that you are just talking about it because it's so so important that we have fairness. As I've been doing this series, one of the things that keeps coming up for me is that women continue to be dismissed. Women in general are just dismissed when it comes to their hormone concerns. So it's obviously even more concerning that there's part of our group of sisters is getting even more dismissed than just women in general. It's not fair. It's not right. It's absolutely it's absolutely hor- horrifying to me. So tell me more about this dismissal of women and from from your experience what you've seen. Oh my gosh, it, it ranges. It's 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 so it's so significant. You know, whether we're talking about autoimmune diagnoses which takes up to 10 to 13 years or we're talking about endometriosis which is a guaranteed 10 years before we get a proper diagnosis especially with women of color like just forget it you just have pelvic inflammatory disease that's what your problem is or you know down to when women hit perimenopause and menopause most doctors one don't know the difference between the two they couldn't tell you which you know maybe based on your age um, but not all women fall into the you know what we call like the natural menopausal age of you know around 52 years old so when women come to the doctor's office with many different types of complaints we have a way of of compartmentalizing them we don't see that that's all interconnected we're not connecting it to the root cause of what's going on but especially in menopause within the medical profession if women are coming to their doctors let's say a massive amount of women are coming to their doctors only 13 percent are actually going to be treated but when we're talking about treatment for menopause we're talking about um, anti-anxiety medications we're talking about synthetic hormones um, and we're talking about other meds to and bir- basically birth control as treat, we're getting close to yeah treating just, symptoms just yeah, treat symptoms. symptoms and also you're crazy because this is all in your head it must not it, it's not actually an actual thing, even though your intuition, which is highly tuned in you as a woman, is screaming at you and your body is telling you something is wrong. Your your doctor is no, saying you're no, just hysterical. You're hysterical. Yeah. yeah. This, this sounds to me like the freaking dark ages. Like this mm-hmm. is what they told women in the eighteen hundreds. You're hysterical. Like have well, we not we evolved? No, we have not. The medical system has not evolved. That is where we're at today. It wasn't even until, you know, before we talk talk about menopause, we didn't even recognize menopause as, you know, having like a cluster of symptoms or that women even went into menopause until we had medications and synthetic drugs to treat it. And that wasn't until the 1950s. But before that, you didn't have it. You were just crazy. And what we ultimately did, and my grandmother was one of these women because she went into menopause before her 50s, um, or right in the 50s, she was just put on tranquilizers. That's it. It was like a frontal lobotomy. And so I remember my mom talks about my grandma coming home one day when she, you know, she had all of this symptomology and they just gave her a tranquilizer and it was like she just became a fraction of who she was. You mentioned your family here and you've, you've talked about you're so open and transparent and passionate. I have been wanting to ask you, was there a defining moment that led you to be so passionate about women's hormone health? I'm, I'm really curious. You know, um, growing up, my mom had very, very serious hormone issues and there were major implications because of that. You know, she really struggled. Um, It was was significantly worse than PMS, but she would have these massive rages. And ultimately um, we, I, my sister and I were, we were just like this little clan, my mom, my sister and I, but we, we ended up taking a brunt of that. Um, And I ended up leaving my mom is as a young, as a preteen, I actually emancipated from her because I just didn't know what was going on. And it wasn't until I was in my 20s and my PMS symptoms were no joke either, you know, and I don't know if that was epigenetics or maybe I had my mama's energy. My mom has always been in survival mode. You know, she was always trying to get by even in her level of success. There's this deep seated belief that my mom holds on to that. Maybe it's not enough. Maybe she's going to lose it. And I think that some of those beliefs definitely manifested in me. So I don't know if it's, if it's epigenetics. I don't know if it was just learned behavior or trauma or a combination of them. But in my 20s, my hormones felt pretty out of control. And I just kept 
powering on just until I hit, I hit a massive proverbial wall. It felt like I got Mack trucked um, and I wasn't able to even function. And so at that point, I started to put the pieces together because it wasn't just me. Everywhere I looked, I saw women dealing with the same issues. And I remember going to the doctor and, you know, sure enough, it was very obvious I had chronic fatigue. Sure enough, my hormones were completely imbalanced. And she hands me this doctor. Um, she hands me a Xanax, a prescription for Xanax and a prescription for birth control. And I remember just, I don't, there. I'm sure I looked so stunned and so disgusted at the same time because I knew what these drugs were and I knew that they had nothing to do with my symptomology. And so that was that defining moment for me as I'm sitting in my car, I'm sitting outside of this, um, this OBGYN's office and I'm thinking to myself, how many hundreds of women are coming through these doors, very similar symptomology, looking for an answer and all they get is a script right? That isn't going to fix what they're really dealing with. And that was that moment where I just knew I had to figure this out. And I also had to fight the fight. I was going to work. I needed to be a part of the solution, not a part of the problem. And it began to click in me that, oh my gosh, what if this was my mom's issue all along? And all they did was try to stick her on birth control. And it just, nothing ever worked. She always just struggled. And we had had a wonderful kind of you know, huge healing process when she hit menopause or about to hit menopause, the end of perimenopause. A lot of women don't realize that it's the end of perimenopause that feels like you're entering the hell gates, not necessarily menopause specifically. And as I took over her care um, and began to really just heal a lot of the trauma that we had dealt with and began to really get her body back on track, um, it's, it blows my mind how much our hormones are definitely connected to our emotional well being and how they're connected to our traumas um, and how it can really manifest in a way that that just doesn't feel good and could potentially, you know, uh, in, in, in my case, you know, other people experience it. Um, and so those were my defining moments is like, I've got to not only clean up this lineage, but mm -hmm. there's got to be so many other daughters and mothers and women out there who just feel so lost and, and lonely and, um, and misinformed and misled in their, in their health journey. And obviously, yep, you know, we, we went to school, you became a doctor, you're yes. a functional medicine doctor. I mean, you are, you're doing root cause medicine and you're doing it specifically around hormone health for women, which is- For women. I was put on this earth for women. And, and I know that to be true. People ask me all the time about men and I love men. I think men are great, but we, women, we, we need more help. You know, we've been put to the wayside for a very long time. We need, we need, um, and we need people like you who care and who really want to look at the multifaceted things mm -hmm. that make us up. And that really makes me interested to know what are some of the most common hormonal imbalances and in general, and, and, yeah. and how do they impact our bodies? What are some things that women should know and look out for? Absolutely. Well, we talked, we, we talked about stress and I, and we talked about, you know, if we look at that cascade, we know that stress impacts one of the first hormones that our stress or stress hormonal system impacts is insulin. Cortisol, which is our number one um, sustained stress hormone, not epinephrine and, and, and norepinephrine or adrenaline, right? Like if someone were to get hit with a car, that's where, that's where adrenaline and, and epinephrine kick in. But for sustained chronic stress, cortisol is the major player. And it's the one you hear a lot of. Um, people don't realize how interconnected cortisol is with not only our gut, um, it can lead to leaky gut. It can lead to gut dysbiosis and, and uh, microbiome issues. But we also know that cortisol plays very strongly with insulin. And so when we're in a state of stress, your body doesn't know the difference between you running from a stranger or a tiger or a bear or whatever you want to call it, and you just dealing with a, a deadline or you're just dealing with being late and stuck in traffic. There's no differentiation. Your brain looks at it all the same. And when that happens, whether you're just, you just accidentally read a crazy text message, your brain thinks that you're about to run. And so it, it releases insulin um, so that we can leverage energy production to fight or flee ultimately. And when we do that too much, we end up deregulating insulin. It's mm -hmm. called insulin resistance. And you don't even have to eat donuts 
to have insulin resistance, which is super scary. And so when we start to see that kind of creation, we know that insulin plays a big role in estrogen dominance. We know that insulin plays a big role in polycystic ovarian syndrome. You know, we wonder why younger girls are getting polycystic ovarian syndrome. Polycystic ovarian syndrome, it's an insulin issue. It's not an ovarian issue. Yes, hence it's happening in the ovaries. Um, and we're unfortunately downgrading our reproductive hormones and increasing our androgens. But the root cause is oftentimes stress, nutrient deficiencies, gut issues that can be driven, and insulin deregulation that can be driven by stress and just prolonged exhaustion. Um, other hormones that we see, you know, deregulate, another metabolic hormone that's a big player is going to be thyroid hormone. And whether it is um, due to a gut issue, whether it's due to stress, I always say if you've got a thyroid issue, you've got a stress issue. Um, or it is, it's due to you know, traumas, whatever that means, nutrient deficiencies. When we start to see you know, what we call hypothyroid or even subclinical hypothyroid, we know that most likely what's going on there is that our, our, our thyroid, our, that, little, that little butterfly gland, is mm -hmm. being impacted by some of those big root causes that I just mentioned as well. And then we start to see major, major levels of exhaustion. We start to see weight gain. We start to see belly fat that are connected and tied into that. And what's really fascinating with all of this is that so much of it is just this massive orchestra. You know, every single one of these hormones are pulling levers with each other. Um, the two hormones that um, we we look at the most are actually the ones that are kind of more down down the road, which is estrogen and progesterone. And they're just really taking the brunt of what's happening with some of these bigger metabolic hormones, cortisol, thyroid hormone, and insulin. And when we see that, what we normally look at is our cycle. You know, our cycle becomes irregular. We notice that PMS symptoms become more intense. Uh, you know, the, you may notice occasionally you'll have a crazy month in August for whatever reason. Maybe it's back to school. Maybe you had crazy travels, lots of uncertainty with, with what's going to happen with the kids. And then September's period comes along and the symptoms are just more heightened. You're bleeding heavier, you're getting more migraines, you're breaking out a little bit more, you're just you're in more pain, you're more irritated. And what's what's fascinating is that it's our, our menstrual cycle is an indicator of what's going on in the body. Most likely your body took a major hit in, in August and you're kind of paying the price for it in September as your, as your hormones have become deregulated. Um, but those are oftentimes the hormones I look at last. I want to know what's going, what's, what's going on in the hierarchy. So those are some of the most common hormonal symptoms that I personally see with women every single day, especially after the age of 30. You've talked about stress as a root cause, and that's something that we can all understand. But I think one of the more sneaky causes that I know you've talked about before are environmental toxins, oh, yeah. things that we don't see or think about. Where do those come from and how can we be more aware of those? Yeah, those are like the icing on the cake, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and that's, you know, unfortunately, there's everyday exposures, whether it's in the food that you eat, it's the medications that you're taking, you know, we could talk all about the, the water you long. drink, the water that you're drinking, really the air that you're breathing, especially a lot of us have been indoors more than ever. Um, and sometimes our indoor air can be significantly more toxic than our outdoor air. Um, and so I always recommend, you know, some free things to do around toxic exposure is one, always take your shoes off. When you come into the house, don't wear your shoes in the house. I love that you said that my house has been a shoes off house as long as I can remember. Yeah. So I mean, every good. time I've come over and it's, it's just a given, right? You know, you just take off your shoes when you get in your house. Um, opening your windows, you know, for t 15 to 30 minutes every single day to just let the air circulate out right. is a big free thing you can do. Um, the other free thing you can do is be consistent in dusting and vacuuming. Um, whether we like it or not, our furniture, our clothes, um, our, you know, cabinets, everything is always off gassing and it ends up inside of our carpets and our floors and our dust that we end up breathing in. Um, and, you know, here's the thing about the respiratory 
nervous system. It's going into the body. It's one of the fastest ways in the bloodstream is through the respiratory system. Um, those are free things to do. But then be looking at our makeup, be looking at our personal care, be looking at um, what we're putting on our body, shampoos, conditioners, lotions, deodorants. Um, one of the reasons why I love using essential oils is that we've made over all of our cleaning products. We've made over almost all of our personal care products, and then I've swapped out all of my makeup. There isn't, there's really nothing in this house outside probably our furniture, which we really couldn't control that much of, that is not non that is not non toxic, right? So, um, and the thing about toxicity is there are a number of stressors. I know the stress that we talked about today was perceived stress. It's the one that we feel. It's the one that weighs on our shoulders. It's the one that sends crazy signals to the brain that you're not safe. However, all kind of, there's all different types of stressors. There's physical stressors um, and there's chemical stressors, right? There's food stressors and all of it, you know, all stress is, is a trigger of inflammation is really what we're looking at right now. And what are ways in which that we can lessen that inflammation? And one of the, the most powerful ways that we as women can do it to decrease obesogens, those are obese driven toxins um, by messing with insulin, leptin and ghrelin, or, um, or xenoestrogens that's messing with, with estrogen and messing with our estrogen detoxification pathways is by simply removing the synthetic crap, the fragrances, um, the, the nasty toxic chemicals in our cleaning supplies and our personal care supplies and replacing them with, with less toxic options and alternatives. I love that you shared all of those wonderful free options. And if you're looking to also do some upgraded options, um, I recently bought air purifiers for my home, hospital grade air purifiers, because we had a lot of fires where I live and the smoke was really bad. So um, just that got me thinking about, it. I'm like, wow, I should have thought of that before because, yes. you know, it's sort of like, you know, you talked about all these things you did to prepare for pregnancy. As you were talking about those things, I was like, wow, those are all things that we should be thinking about doing whether we're getting time. pregnant or not. Yeah. And like <laughs> this stuff you're talking about, it's like we it's like we wait to get like dinged or we wait to get injured or have an issue and suffer before we pay attention to this stuff. And that's just unfortunately how we learn or maybe it's fortunate, right? Because when we get that ding, we we we, we pay attention. So I love the I love the air purifiers. I love Essential water purifiers, water, water yeah. purifiers. And I actually started getting Mountain Valley spring water delivered to my home because I wanted that minerality in my water. Um, but I also love like, you know, I've got my AquaTrue system. You can get a system built into your house. There's all these different ways to purify your air and water are kind of essential for all of us, you know, they like, are 100%. And honestly, they're the reason why they're essential is both reasons are helping to drive energy production inside of the body and yep. the cell. <laughs> so it's really, it's really fascinating how those are, I mean, at the end of the day, why we breathe is because our mitochondria needs that oxygen to create ATP. It's, it's really fascinating. The whole circulatory system, the whole respiratory system is built around those little mitochondria. Um, and, you know, when it comes to toxicity, it's a lot easier to avoid it than to deal with it once it's in the system. And so yes. my, my three rules is avoidance, avoidance, avoidance. Avoidance, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, like I, I had to move away from the house I lived in last year because I ended up getting toxic mold um, from that house. I was literally breathing mold in. And that's another thing. You can test for mold in your house, but in wetter climates, this is something that it's good to be aware of. It came from water, like water-soaked um boards and, and stuff in the house and it was in the ventilation system. So this, and like Very I had scary. to learn the hard way, I had to figure it out the hard way, the long way around. Right. And I'm so grateful that I, that I was able to, and that I'm treating it, but it's like, this is, and, and I'm also grateful for all of the healthy habits that I already had, how clean my water was, all the things I knew to do to take care of myself, because I had a lot of resilience built into my body. I was able to to carry that load and to get better faster. So all of these, now now that brings me to really like the golden question is what are some of the things that we can do to reduce our stress levels? What are some of, if this is one of the biggest root causes, right? Like we've talked about how to reduce the load of some of these environmental things, but what are some of your best practices for reducing stress levels? <laughs> Life's crazy right now, we all know it. And there's a lot more stress floating around. So if we've identified that we all want to reduce our stress more just because we don't want to have to suffer some of these consequences you've discussed, 
what are some of your best tips? Absolutely. So most of the time, most of us don't know that we're in a stress state. We're just, we just think we're operating the way that we normally operate. Um, so the first, I have three steps. Number one, important to notice that you're getting triggered. And I know you're thinking, I have no idea. There's I, what, what it, it's not like there's like a little buzzer that goes off that says you're getting triggered. <laughs> um, notice a couple things to notice is how people are responding to you. If people are coming looking at you crazy or like you notice that your family's having to feel defensive around you, you most likely you've been triggered. Um, so it's important to notice those physiological signs. Maybe you're feeling hot and sweaty. Maybe your face gets flushed. Maybe your breathing becomes more in a shallow box. Um, your heart is beating faster. Maybe you feel a rush of anxiety. Maybe you used to think that was like your slight edge, but no, that's your body trying to manage a stressful circumstance. Um, and so that's the first step is just noticing that trigger. Next is to focus on your senses. So again, we're talking about not only a hormone system that's driving stress, but we're talking about an electrical system and that's your central nervous system. Definitely the, the most powerful system in the body. And it's in what we call sympathetic mode, which is survival of the fittest mode. And the only way that we can change that sympathetic state is to, is to shift our state literally. And we do that through the senses, whether it is you're giving yourself a massage, um, you're walking, you just kind of walk around, shake it off, um, or you start to do some, some deep breaths, like six breaths in, six breaths out. Maybe you've got an essential oil like lavender or cedar wood or a citrus oil that you can leverage to kind of shift that state as well. You also shift your hormones too. You downregulate cortisol. You downregulate the stress response system with those oils. But basically knowing those states. And then the other thing I recommend as a proactive option is to send the brain safety signals well before you're ever experiencing stress or trauma. So that is self-care meditation, a walk outside, maybe your phone is set every hour to, to just breathe in an oil or take some deep breaths, maybe shake it off, get out of your seat. Dance. When you, dance, <laughs> dance. These are all safety signals. These are, yeah. all these are all telling your brain, it's all good. We're, we're cool. We're good. We're good here. And the more that your brain can receive those little safety signals, the better off we are. It doesn't go into that reactive trigger mode that we automatically can go into if we're not sending lovely safety signals. And then the last thing is send a text message, reach out to a friend or a family member. Maybe there's someone in the house that you can give a hug to, or that you kind of have, maybe you have like a safety word, like pineapples. I don't know, whatever your safety word Pat, is. Pat, your, your emotional support animal. Exactly. Yeah. Your emotional. Yes. You know, your, your dog, give your dog a cuddle, right? Give, give, Bodhi, a cuddle or, you know, and so those are all ways that change state as well. Um, and it will take you from fight or flight down to relaxation. Um, and there's a lot of different ways. I mean, ultimately, it's really about being proactive. Um, the more that we can be more that we can send those beautiful safety signals to the brain, the more the brain doesn't overreact to what would be considered a small thing. Um, and you even may, on the rational side, say to yourself, man, why am I even reacting to that? And it's just because our, our brains are overreactive. It's just trying to protect you. Yeah. But we've, if we have these little mechanisms in place, we really can we can lock, we can lock it down. And that's why I'm such a big proponent of a morning ritual and an evening ritual. You know, something as simple as just writing out gratitude, grabbing a little oil, doing a little five minute prayer, whatever it is. Um, at night, I have a little crystal by my bed and I, I list off all the things that I'm grateful for that day. Like all the things that happened for me that day, um, the little things. Um, so I just I literally, it, it, it's a way to shut off the mental chatter because I get filled with gratitude. Mm, I just want to sit here and take in all of that because what you just said is so profound. It's, it's, it, I'm, I'm, I always like, I'm always thinking in patterns. So I was immediately in my mind just seeing how much that parallels the reasons why, if we want to be able to be capable and strong throughout our lives physically, we need to train. We train, we, we have a, you know, we try to train at least three days a week, maybe more. Um, and we're, we're making time for that. We prioritize it, right? And 
you are talking about doing that strategically, proactively for our mind, because we want a long, healthy life in uh, a brain and body that are working well together. And that that impact that has on the stress response affects so many other systems and it all works together. But I just feel like that what you're just talking about with the being proactive in that sense, um, creating rituals for yourself, tuning into your senses, noticing even something as small as notice your bowel movements daily. Like, are they healthy? Because if you're constantly having unhealthy bowel movements where the the quantity or consistency, and you guys remember Dr. Walls talked about this a while back, um, when they're not healthy, uh, you're, you may not be absorbing your nutrients correctly. And Marisa was talking about um, gut health as one of those real harbingers of- And, and nutrient depletion. Nutrient depletion, exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and so if you're stressed out and you're not able to absorb your nutrients and you may not be eating, you, you're, you're just eat, if you're if you're constantly eating, looking at your phone, doing work, stressing out about what you're doing, like give yourself that time to like enjoy your meal, you know, like be present at night when you're going to sleep, do your ritual, read a book, don't sit in front of your TV and get stressed. Even I think a lot about even the stress that comes from watching a movie. Um, yeah. And especially at night, like because movies, the people who score the movies with the music, they're brilliant and they, they, they pull your emotions along with you, you know, and you're, you're on this crazy trajectory watching a movie and, and you don't realize how much it impacts your, your sleep state, right? Or Facebook and social, you know, how triggering it can be, how divisive it can be, you know, all of a sudden you're having a relaxing evening and you get caught up in some crazy article just, just, just works you up, right? Um, something to be mindful of. Mm. Um, Oh my gosh. No, I'm just, I'm agreeing with you like a hundred percent. Like, yes. It's especially right now. It's a, it's a scary divisive place. I mean, if you want to raise your blood pressure, you get on Facebook, you know what I'm saying? Like, so just protecting your energy is so, so critical here and being proactive about what, what you would love, what would serve you, you know, and, and how you want to show up in the world. I think that's always important. You know, this conversation, you know, I didn't want to talk about, you know, Clearly, there are some foods that can create inflammation, but this isn't about what you should or shouldn't eat or what you should or shouldn't do. It's really just about listening to your body and doing what is right for you at that moment. Um, and that's really what this is about. And, and beginning to have that awareness. Again, there, were, there was a decade, probably more, where I just had no awareness at all about what my body was trying to tell me. And I, you know, my always, my goal is that no one ended up or ends up, you know, with the countless health issues that I ended up dealing with because I wasn't aware of all of the, the whispers and the signals that my body was trying to share with me. Um, and it can be so simple. You know, I still, I still show up in the world doing, doing me. I still love what I do. I still, I'm so passion driven. Um, but I'm so mindful about how I take care of myself and what my body's trying to tell me. And honestly, it, it, that's the biggest game changer outside of, of digging into those beliefs and those, those limiting beliefs and, and root causes. Um, but yeah, it, it doesn't have to be super complicated. And, and that's what I hope everyone, hope each and every one of you are taking away from this conversation is just becoming more in tune with what we love, becoming more in tune with what our bodies need and being a little bit more proactive in ensuring that our bodies are functioning for us, not against us. I really, really appreciate all of that. And I know that you, you guys probably feel just like I do. You, you can never get enough of Dr. Marisa, right? So she's got an incredible podcast that you can listen to. It's the Essentially You podcast, and we'll be sure to put a link to it in our show notes page, as well as links to her website, her fabulous books, her resources. She's amazing. Such a powerhouse. I love her Instagram account. And she's also got a free supplements guide um, to help support your hormones that um, we also really want you to get your hands on. Special guest for special gift for all of our listeners. So uh, be sure to get a link to that. We will put it absolutely everywhere. And I just want to give you the last word. Um, is there anything else that you would like to impart to our listeners today? Anything else you'd like to say? Absolutely. So no matter where you are in this healing journey, and I know some days it can feel discouraging and feel like you're going it alone. I just want you to know that you're not. There are so many wonderful resources. And at the end of the day, you are worthy of healing. 
You are worthy of feeling amazing. You are worthy of loving your body. And I promise you, with just a couple simple little things, um, your your body will, will it wants it at its very core to work for you. Um, and, um, and just really want to impart that message because for a long time, I didn't believe that myself and, um, took me a little while to figure that out. And it's probably one of the most profound lessons I've learned in my healing journey. Words to remember and live by. Thank you so much for everything today, sister. It's been so good to have you on. Thanks for having me. And thank you, my wonderful listeners, for taking this time for yourself today, for spending your valuable time with me and Dr. Marisa. And you can get all of the links from our show today, including the free gift we have for you over at thebettyrocker.com backslash podcast. I absolutely loved getting the opportunity to tie so many themes together that we've touched on in our women's hormone health and women's health series. I've been thinking a lot about the importance of being proactive with our self-care. Dr. Marisa mentioned she's pregnant and that's a time many women really prioritize their self-care. So do women who are getting ready to conceive and are often consciously, you know, really paying more attention than they ever do at any other period in their lives. But why shouldn't we always be prioritizing it? You know, whether you're planning to conceive or you're well past your childbearing days, I think we can all get valuable lessons to apply at any stage of life from the proactive self-care tools women use to create their best state for fertility and pregnancy. That's why I'm really excited for you to tune in next week with the executive director of the Fertility and Pregnancy Institute, Dr. Cleopatra, who teaches women to use the prime master, the magical and powerful window of opportunity before pregnancy, when we literally have the the power to change the quality and expression of the genes that we pass down to our babies and grandbabies to create super babies. Dr. Cleopatra has scientifically studied tens of thousands of women and families and has helped women in 21 countries on six continents have their super babies, and her work has been cited in over 1,000 scientific studies in the past five years alone. Tune in, Rockstar, even if you're not pregnant or planning on becoming pregnant, because the insights and science behind taking amazing care of your body can be applied at any stage of life you're in and help you thrive. And you never know when you'll want to share this information with a friend or a relative. Until next time, I'm Betty Rocker and you are so awesome and amazing. Don't you forget it. I'll talk to you again real soon. This podcast is for information purposes only. Statements and views expressed on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Brie Argett Singer, Betty Rocker Inc. and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein. Before starting a new exercise, fitness or health protocol, or if you think you have a medical problem, always consult a licensed physician.